Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 2. But there is one thing that happens to everyone. We all die. Death comes to good people and bad people. Death comes to those who are pure and to those who are not pure. Death comes to those who give sacrifices and to those who don't give sacrifices. Good people will die just as sinners do. Those who make promises to God will die just as those who are afraid to make those promises. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 2. There is a time to be born and there is a time to die. Chapter 12, verse 7, your body came from the earth and when you die, it will return to the earth. But your spirit came from God and when you die, your spirit, it will return to him. It will return to God. Now let's read Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. Everyone must die once, then they are judged. Now, there are some questions that are now arisen out of our study of Enoch. And those questions, we are preparing ourselves to answer those questions. We've not started answering them, but we are looking at some foundation to help us in answering these questions. Now, the first question then is, where did Enoch and indeed Elijah, where did they go when God took them? Where are they now? And the other question is, do Elijah and Enoch Do they have any connection to the two witnesses of the book of Revelation? So last episode, what we started doing is to try and lay some foundation, some background that will help us in answering these questions. We we look at the question of death. I mean, we've done that in previous study, but we looked at it again. And the question we were asking ourselves is, what is death? And it was important for us to look at that because the question we were asking ourselves is, did Enoch die? Did Elijah die? Especially since the Bible tells us that God took Enoch so that he would not see death. And we look at various individuals and group that were taken up in the Bible. Various group of people that were taken up in the Bible. We look at our Lord Jesus Christ, obviously. We look at Enoch. We look at Elijah. Then we look at Philip. And then we look at the end time rapture church. This is what we concluded that yes, Enoch and Elijah, they did not experience death the conventional way. However, they died. Their rapture put an end to their physical existence. And that is essentially what death is. Their rapture put an end to their physical existence because to be raptured is to die. To be raptured is to die. Now, it is not conventional death. It is not death in the conventional sense. But what we need to understand is that the taking of Enoch and the taking of Elijah is actually the way they died or is actually the way their physical existence ended or it is actually the way they changed form of existence. And that is the definition of death. The question we want to ask today is what then happened after death? Remember, we are laying foundation so that we can then go back to Enoch and go back to Elijah. So the question is what happens after death? Now, we need to understand that the revelation and the teaching of the scripture is that death is not the end of life. Death does not put an end to life. Death just put an end to physical existence. And it is very, very important that we understand this, that we saw the other time, death only reverses what happened as birth. So at birth, physical existence started. At physical death, physical existence ended. But death is not an end of life. Death is not an end of life. Rather, death is the beginning of another life. Death is actually the beginning of afterlife. In other words, there is life after death. And it is very, very important for us to understand that, that no matter how death comes, life is not extinct at physical death. I will say that again because this is important. No matter how death comes, whether somebody died by being raptured or somebody died in an explosion or somebody died naturally, no matter how death comes, life is not extinct at physical death. Remember, death is simply a transfer from one form of existence or one form of consciousness to another. 
in death, life is not extinct. Remember what we read in that Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7. It said, your spirit came from God, and when you die, it will return to God. Yes, your body fell off. That is, if you die natural death, your body fell off. Or if you die by rapture, your body is disintegrated or your body, as it were, changed form. Your body just disappeared because it is changed into another body. Or if you are Enoch uh, or if you are Elijah, your body just disintegrates by God's power. But your spirit does not stop existing. The Bible says here in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7, that your spirit will return to God. It will return to him. Your spirit came from God, and when you die, it will return to God. So we must not be deceived. We must not be confused because there are ideologies and teaching that wants to bring confusion. All human will die physically, but their souls and their spirits will live forever. All humans will die physically, but physical death is not the end. It's not an extinction of their soul and spirit. Every human that ever lived and walked the surface of this earth, their spirit and their soul will live forever. Now, the question then is, where will you spend eternity? That is the question. There is no argument about whether anybody will live forever. Every single human being will live forever. So eternal life does not mean living forever. As Christians, we have eternal life, but that talks about the quality of the life. That talks about the attitude of the life or the attitude of that life as it relates to God. The question is not whether we will live forever. The question is, where are we going to live in eternity? Remember what we read in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, earlier today, he said, everyone must die. And they are then judged. Everyone must die. Then they are judged. Romans chapter 14 verse 12 says that every one of us shall give account of himself to God. So the question here is that when we get out of this life, it's not the end of our life, it's the beginning of another life, it's the beginning of afterlife. And the Bible is telling us here that in that life, we will be judged that in that life, we will give account of ourselves to God. Now, that is what I want to talk about today, because the Bible reveals to us at least two types of judgment following physical death. Now, some people talk about three, but I'm going to be focusing on two types of judgment that the Bible reveals that will take place following physical death. And this feed in into the question that we asked earlier on, that is not a question of, will you live forever? The answer to that is yes. The question really is, where are you going to spend eternity? Are you going to spend it with God or are you going to spend it away from God? So I said the Bible reveals two types of judgment following physical death. And this is adapted to the two destinations of human souls after death. So two types of judgment that we are going to talk about today. Number one, the Bible talks about the judgment seat of Christ. That's number one, the judgment seat of Christ. Number two, the Bible talks about the great white throne judgment. So two judgments that we are looking at. Again, like I said, people talk about three, but we are looking at these two. Number one is the judgment seat of Christ. And number two is the great white throne judgment. Now, these two judgments are different in their subjects. They are different in their purpose and they are different in their content. So these two judgments are not the same. They are different in the subject upon whom the judgment is applied. They are different in the purpose for which the judgment is taking place and they are different in their content. Now, let's look first at the judgment seat of Christ. We are looking first at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, the judgment seat of Christ is when believers give an account of themselves to Christ. Now, this is very, very important. The judgment seat of Christ is when believers give an account of themselves to Christ. It is a time of examination. It is a time of reward. It is a time of 
accountability. It is a time when our master, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, will in, in, inspect our works, what we did with the resources that God has given us. Now, that is what will take place at the judgment seat of Christ. The Lord Jesus, he will examine our faithfulness. The Lord Jesus, he will examine our loyalty. And the end of that is that we will either receive reward or we will suffer loss of the reward. And that is what takes place at the judgment seat of Christ. Let's read some scripture to help us in understanding this. So we are going to read 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And that is where we get that term from. For we all must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he has done, whether it be good or bad. Matthew chapter 10, verses 41 and 42 he that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of this little one a cup of cold waters only in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. And I want you to see how he's talking about reward and reward and reward repeatedly. Now let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and we are going to read from verse 11 all the way to verse 15. And I want you to see the dynamics of what the Holy Spirit is speaking here through Paul to the church at Corinth. For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man built upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or stubble, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort is it. If any man's work abide, which he has built thereupon, he shall receive again a reward. If any man's work shall be burnt, he shall what? suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire." I've read a couple of scriptures, and I'm not going to be commenting on each one of them individually. But what I want you to see here is that at the judgment seat of Christ is only for believers. It is only believers that will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. It is only believers. At the judgment seat of Christ, believers will be examined. Believers will be rewarded. That is what is going to take place at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, we need to understand that this judgment that we are talking about does not determine the salvation of the believer. That has already been sorted. That has already been concluded. You know, because these people, they are at the judgment seat of Christ because they are already saved. That is why they are there in the first place. So the judgment that is taking place at the judgment seat of Christ is not to determine the believer's salvation. That is already settled. They will not be at this meeting or at this judgment seat if they were not children of God, if they were not people of God in the first place. What qualified them to be at this judgment seat of Christ is because they are saved. So the believer will not experience second death. What is second death? Now, if you go back to the episode we did in episode 228, episode 228, we did mention briefly the question of second death. And I'm going to mention it again when we go to the second section of this teaching. But believers will not experience the second death because the second death is the eternal separation of the soul and the spirit from God himself. Believers will not experience that. Revelation chapter 2 verse 11 says that he that had here, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Okay, so we have seen that this judgment seat of Christ, this is for believers. They are the subject, okay? And we have seen the purpose and we have seen the content of, of that judgment is for believers, for their works to be examined, how we have used the resources that he gave us. It was just like that nobleman that traveled and gave his servant things 
to, to you know to 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 use okay he said occupy till i come so this is actually a time of accountability where our works are examined and where we receive reward now the word that was translated judgment seat in the original scripture you know we read that word judgment seat in second corinthians chapter 5 verse 10 actually the word the greek word that is translating judgment seat is just one word and it is the word bima, bima. So we can talk about the bima seat. It is the word bima. And in those days, this word, this is what it means. In those days, when you go to an at- athletics meet, when you go to where people have all these, you know, athletes, in those days, judges will sit at the bima to view athletic games. So when you go to the games, athletic games, the bima is actually where the judges sit. That is the judgment seat. Okay, now what do the judges do? They make sure that the contestant follow the rule and also they present a word to the victor. That is what they do. And exactly that is what we are seeing here. That is the illustration. That is the picture that the judgment seat of Christ is painting. So the bima is a place of testing and it's a place of reward. It's a place of testing and it's a place of reward. So the same way, the bima of Christ or the judgment seat of Christ, you know, I always want to say the bima seat, but that would be tautology because that would be like saying the judgment seat seat. <laughs> so, so the bima of Christ or the judgment seat of Christ is exactly the same like the bima of the judges during the athletic games. So the bima of Christ will not be a place of condemnation. No, it is a place where reward are given. And this is the reason why all throughout the scripture, the believers are encouraged over and over to be sober and to be vigilant, to wash and pray, to contend for the faith, to occupy till he comes, to cast not away our confidence or to fight the good fight of faith. You will notice that I've pulled those out from various scripture. This is the reason why we have been encouraged to do this because there is going to be a judgment. We are going to stand at, at the bima of Christ. We all are going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ so that we can be rewarded for our work and our faithfulness here on earth. If you read Galatians chapter 6 verse 9, Galatians chapter 6 verse 9 said, and let us not be weary in well-doing for in due season what we shall reap if we faint not. Revelation chapter 22 verse 12 says, and behold, I come quickly. This is the Lord Jesus talking. He said, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. And this is why we are being encouraged. This is why the scripture encourages us to, you know, to commit and to be faithful, to wash and pray, to contend for the faith, to occupy till he comes, to be sober and to be vigilant, to cast not away our confidence and to fight the good fight of faith. Now that word, the good fight of faith, that is exactly what Paul said at the end of his life. Let's go and read that one. It is in the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verses 6 to 8. For I am now ready, Paul says, to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, you see, the reward. Henceforth, there is laid off for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. So let us look at the second judgment. And this is the great white throne judgment. The great white throne judgment. And this is what we read in Revelation chapter 20 and verses 11 to 15. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open, and other books were open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell deliver up the dead which were in them. 
and they will judge every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So the great white throne judgment, the great white throne judgment. Now, this is the final judgment of the wicked. This is not the bema of Christ. This is the great white throne judgment. Who are those that appear before the great white throne? The Bible says these are everyone whose name was not found written in the book of life. So these are unbelievers. These are the people that have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ in their life. They have rejected the offer of the blood of the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And those are the ones that will have to stand before the great white throne and be judged. Now, what will be the final outcome? They will spend eternity in the lake of fire. And this is what the Bible calls the second death. The second death. When we read Revelation chapter 21 verse 8, it says, But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderer and the whoremonger and the sorcerers and the idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And if you are listening to me, God does not want you to experience the second death. But the only way you and I can spend eternity with God is by understanding and knowing and accepting that we are sinners and that we can only be saved through the blood and the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ and by coming to him and asking him to save us. And he will. He will save us if we ask him to. He cannot force this on us. And if we ask him to save us, he will save us. And what will then happen is that we'll become a daughter, sons, children of God, we'll become citizens of his kingdom, and he will walk with us through the rest of our life here on earth. And when this is all over, we will not stand at the great white throne judgment. Rather, we will stand, stand at the judgment seat of Christ so that we can be rewarded for our work here. And so that we can spend eternity with him in the new heaven and the new earth. Do it right now. Tomorrow may be too late. Do it now. 